what I'm going to talk to you guys about this afternoon um, is going to be broken up into three little sections. I'm going to give you a bit of background as to some of the work that uh, I did over at Tigerberg come Stellenbosch University with our postgraduates. Those are guys who are already qualified as docs but specializing particularly in internal medicine at our department. Then we'll look at how to use concept maps in as an assessment tool. And there's quite a bulk of information relating to that. And then I'll finish off with a little bit on personal learning environments. OK, so what did we do with our postgrad medical students? This was a project initiated 2010, finished off early this year. And basically what we did was teach the postgrads uh, how to use CMAP tools in a workshop. Right at the outset, we wanted to find out was there a difference between their approaches to learning, their learning styles, deep learning as opposed to particularly surface learning or strategic learning. Um, and we used the tool called the Revised Approaches to Studying Inventory, which is the tool um, that Noel Entwistle from Edinburgh popularized mostly um, looking at medical students, because he's a, a doc, um, but has application to many aspects of education, has been used in the industry as well. So we did a revised approach to studying inventory to start off with. Then we told our, our postgrads, right, you know how to do concept mapping now, off you go, and we want two concept maps every month. You'll come back. You present those concept maps to your colleagues for some critique and some uh, formative assessment, a bit of feedback. You can change them, update them if they need to be updated. I'll publish them on the internet for you, and I'll do some evaluation, uh, mark those concept maps, give them scores, and I'll show you how we did that a little later on. And then right at the end, they were again evaluated uh, using the revised approaches to studying inventory, had an exit interview which was anonymized, and an online questionnaire. Okay, what I want to just quickly run by you is the work that went into the background of supporting this project. What was created was two virtual servers running on the university <laughs> network, an internet information server, concept map server, and just by the way, the Concept Map server um, software is free, and I'm sure, Gavin, you probably know about it, and others I'm sure know that you can actually run an Apache server um, and run your own Concept Map server if you're wanting to do that and get into that technicality. Um, we tied the two together using a content management system. And the aim was to improve learning. Um, looking at the literature, it looked as though there were two major areas that we could influence, namely metacognition, um, what the students know about how they study, and formative assessment. The final summative assessment is done externally to, in fact, all medical faculties in the country uh, on the postgraduate side of things by the College of Medicine of South Africa. So we focused on the metacognition and the formative assessment. And as I alluded to, we had this research project where we did a RASI, uh, did some exit interviews. They did their concept maps, which we hoped would promote some deep learning. These were scored, and I'll show you the scoring method later on, and peer-reviewed. And just a little bit of extra background, there was quite a lot of else, uh, other stuff going on on the website. It was also used for providing access to the latest literature in medicine um, and various other resources, particularly basic sciences, which our students are not particularly good at. So there was access to all of that sort of a stuff as well. And the whole sort of claim to fame of this blended learning environment was that it was a constructivist type learning environment with those three aspects, meaningful context for learning, uh, being able to personally construct your knowledge and to collaborate, particularly 
in these peer reviewed sessions ok straight on to the results it was a case study and we had both qualitative and quantitative data coming out of it and I've alluded to the RASI to start off with before and after no changes in the students approaches to learning which I found rather uh, surprising but looking back at the data our students had a score on average to start off with of about 42 out of 50 which is approximately uh, 84 percent now whether you can increase that all that much by whatever intervention you do is rather doubtful interestingly the literature seems to suggest that concept mapping will benefit the poorer performing students the ones really at the bottom of the scale seem to benefit the most and I can only sort of refer to one particular individual that I had in, our, in my group who had an initial RASI score of 13 out of 50 which is very low extremely low um, for that particular group and at the end of the study he had more than doubled his uh, deep learning score to 32 out of um, 50 which I thought was really very interesting but um, that's just one very isolated uh, case using the scoring system which I'll show you in a little while um, the concept maps toward the end of the study were a lot more complex uh, they had more connections uh, more concepts and particularly looking at uh, the concept maps using a tool called CMAP analysis and again I'll show you CMAP analysis a little later there was more route to child branching now this as you know at the top the results is the route and these are the children concepts coming out of it so the route to child ratio was greater toward the end of the study the online questionnaire showed that <coughs> students found concept maps pretty easy to use so much so that some of them preferred the using concept maps to written summaries and they said it was a lot quicker um, and they understood what was on the go more with more clarity far more context to their learning they did talk about providing new insights and you know about the cross links in concept maps which particularly uh, traverse levels of the concept map across the hierarchy and are s said to promote uh, light bulb type moments what was interesting was that a lot of them found new impetus for studying they said wow this is great stuff time flies by uh, I really enjoy getting stuff off the internet making these links uh, adding resources to my concept map and they found it really good stuff so the exit interview um, corroborated the findings in the online questionnaire they found it more stimulating more structured particularly facilitated review now this was an aspect on the metacognition side that we'd emphasized in the workshops and that was uh, alluding to work done at the University of Waterloo in the UK where they had a particular um, research around technique on revision and I'm not too sure if you're familiar with the one day one week one month pattern uh, of revision but we told the students right you've got these concept maps you can either have them on the screen or print them out uh, and the technique is to close your eyes try and draw the concept map in your mind and then open your eyes see what you've left out and learn that and do that 24 hours after you've done the concept map a week later and at the end of a month and they found that particularly helpful and also just applying theory to practice um, things like abnormal liver functions um, in a 
particular patient. What we also did with the comments from the students at the exit interview was analyze them using um, Atlas TI, uh, which is taxonomy type um, tool for analyzing uh, free text. And you're familiar with Bloom's revised taxonomy. On the left-hand side, you'll see the little um, pyramid from the lower order thinking skills at the bottom to the higher order thinking skills. And the comments in the little graph relate uh, to all aspects of Bloom's taxonomy, which I found very interesting. So um, particularly a, an emphasis on the lower order thinking skills, understanding and remembering, but right throughout, concept maps relate to facets of Bloom's revised taxonomy. Now, looking at a different approach, a chap by the name of Marzano has also gone ahead and proposed a taxonomy for learning. And having a look at his schema, it consists of self-system, which is basically the decision-making process. The self-system engages the metacognitive system, and according to Marzano, the metacognitive system is the control center. It interacts and, uh, and controls both your cognitive and your knowledge systems. These are each broken down, and the description is given in the uh, center there. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. You can read that in an article if you like yourself. But what I found very interesting in looking at concept mapping is that, again, the concept mapping influences all aspects of this particular um, model of learning. And it does seem that concept mapping is actually very uh, thorough in addressing pretty much the whole facet of all the thought processes that we go through uh, or our students go through when we're attempting to learn. All right, I was going to show you the postgraduate website, but I think you've had a link to that, and I don't have an internet connection here, so it's not all that important. Suffice to say that if you want to go and look at the postgrad website, there are at least 80 or so concept maps which my students have done on the uh, sumed.sun.ac.za website. Don't try and put a www in front of it because it just won't work. But sumed.sun.ac.za is where you'll find that. Any questions on that particular facet so far? Before I move on to the assessment aspect. Okay, everyone seems happy. Let's get on to something relating to assessment using particularly concept mapping. And there are a lot of ways that you can go about doing this. Um, they don't seem obvious to start off with, but you can do, for instance, fill in the blanks. Now, here's a concept map on the thyroid gland that one of my students produced. This is the complete concept map. And to use the fill in the blanks technique, you can just remove the linking phrases, pop them into a um, concept on the left-hand side, and tell your students, right, off you go, create a concept map. They're the linking phrases. Fill them in the right spots. and you can check whether your student has gotten back to your original concept map or not. So that's looking at linking phrases. You can use pre-selected terms or a so-called parking lot, which is even less structured. And here you just dump all the concepts higgledy-piggledy onto a screen or a bit of paper, and again tell your students structure that into a concept map for me. And they have to off, go off and go and do that. And again, this is mostly linking phrases, but it's even less structured 
than the previous concept map. You can use what's called micro mapping, where you give your students an aspect, a little chunk of a concept map and say, right, tell me what else you know on this particular topic. Fill in as much as you can. And obviously, as the lecturer, you will have done your complete concept map, and you can compare the student's concept map with the one produced by the expert. And this is a particular concept map drawn up by one of my students, once again, on the action of diuretics in the kidneys. And again, I'll show you how to compare two concept maps using the CMAP tools program. Collaborative mapping, I don't have an example here, but you could, for instance, tell a group to go ahead and as a group, as a task, the five of you need to get together either um, synchronously or, as you're probably aware, concept mapping allows you to um, remotely connect and work on the same concept map. So you could do that as a group and give the group a mark on the concept map if you need to. Right, the fifth aspect is so-called unguided mapping. And this is the task that I gave my students being postgraduates. I thought, you guys are intelligent enough, not going to actually do any of the work for you. You need to do it all yourselves. And so I said, right, you choose the topic. You choose how you're going to structure the concept map. I'm going to give you the scoring system. Uh, you can mark them yourselves, but uh, I will be doing that as well. And this is the scoring system that I used. Now, in the literature, you'll find that there are quite a lot of scoring systems. Mine is a hybrid that I drew up from a number of sources, and it worked very nicely for me. And as I, I mentioned earlier, I was able to demonstrate a difference from outset to three months later on their scores. And the simple way of doing it was count the number of propositions, one for each valid proposition, count the links in and out of concepts, and score one point per valid link, count the levels of hierarchy in your concept map, score those five, check if they're cross links, crossing levels, 10 points for that, and if there's a focus question, um, again 10 points, focus question being important to try and limit the size of your concept map, otherwise it just gets bigger and bigger and uh, overwhelming. And then resources, as you know, you can drag and drop pretty much any electronic resource onto your concept or onto your linking phrase, and it will create a beautiful little link for you, uh, whether it's a URL, PDF, whatever resource you want to use. Now, and Gavin in my emails backwards and forwards, he was particularly interested in the rubrics. And although I created a rubric, I have never actually used this in practice. My rubric particularly re relates to the scoring uh, that I use. And you'll see that this is it. It's, is there a focus question? Uh, is there a list of concepts, linking phrases, the hierarchical structure, uh, and particularly counting levels, counting cross-links, uh, counting resources, and giving it a score uh, according to the rubric. You can create your own rubric, and this particular rubric that I showed you uh, is based on a rubric that I came across from the University of Minnesota on concept mapping. And their particular rubric was quite different. Um, they used softer criteria and not really sort of countable stuff, more impressions on these aspects. And again, you know, if anybody's interested, 
I will email these to Gavin or whoever with pleasure. And you might be particularly interested in an article that I came across on the inter-rater reliability of, um, oops, but too small. of using a rubric to mark concept maps for medical students. Okay. That's on the assessment side of things. All right. The next thing I was wanting to show you is, let's go ahead and actually do the scoring. How do we do that? And... Uh, Then we have a relatively complicated concept map with a spoke and hand type layout. And it can be quite difficult to decide how many levels of hierarchy they are and whether all the have concepts, linking phrases, and propositions are correct. Fortunately, CMAP tools provide us with a little which is this little page icon to the right of the concept map. If you click on that, it will open up a tab display of various aspects of the concept map. It selects all the concepts, scrolls through the concepts, counts them if you need to, links into concepts, links out of concepts, it combines linking phrases, to have a look at the linking phrases themselves, make sense, all the two together, concepts with linking phrases to form propositions. And again, these can be scrolled through, make sense of, counted, and scored. And it even provides with an outline, which allows you to count the level Right, now I just need to find out where I was. The other aspect of, of um, concept mapping that I was wanting to show you this doesn't show up too well on the, or project too well. But you can compare two concept maps electronically. Very handy little tool built into CMAP tools. And this would be good if the expert or lecturer did the master concept map, and then let's say <coughs> a group of 20, 30, whatever students um, did their own concept maps on the particular topic, and you could compare it to the expert. And the particular place to go to is Tools. Down the bottom of the menu system is Compare CMAPs. And the open CMAP on the left-hand side is the uh, lecturer's concept map. And this little tab says Select CMAP. You select the student's concept map. You check the boxes with the little criteria that you want to compare. And off it goes and compares the two concept maps. And again, not too readable,
but you get a nice little report and the little tab at the bottom says export as a text file and you can export the automatic comments um, comparison of the two as a text file and again assign a score to it either using a rubric or using uh, a match of 70% of the concepts map and match the uh, lecturers, 50% of the um, linking phrases, let's say, match the lecturers, and then you might have some sort of combined score for that for your students. The other tool that you might be interested in is a thing called CMAP analysis. Now, CMAP analysis is still a research tool. It's a bit rough around the edges. And again, I can let uh, anybody have a copy who's interested. It is a tool that looks at concept maps in the CXL format. I don't know if you've played around with the export function of CMAP tools. Um, and besides the PDFs and um, graphics formats and HTML, there is a CXL or a concept map XML file format that you can export your CMAP uh, tools files as. And the procedure is to send all your students' concept maps as CXL files to a particular folder. You open up this CMAP analysis tool and you tell it, I want to look at these 10, 15 parameters uh, and produce an XML file, uh, not an XML, um, Excel file um, with all the results. And it chugs through your 80, 90, 100, however many concept maps you've got in that particular folder and produces scores for you on each of the parameters that you've selected. Quite a nice tool and um, one that I found quite useful in analyzing some of the more esoteric functions of concept maps like branching, um, how many child nodes there are, what the root child count is, and various other aspects of n a networked environment that you can't easily count um, just with the scoring table that I showed you earlier on. Okay, looks like we've covered the assessment. Any questions on that particular aspect up to now? Um, <coughs> can we edit any mathematical formulas? You can edit mathematical formulas on concept mapping. Um, let me just escape here and go to this aspect and there's your little mathematical character set which you can build into CMAP tools or whatever concept map that you're playing around with. And um, graphs? Graphs you can only put in if they're graphics or Excel formats or the, you know, that sort of a thing um, or link to the electronic resource as, as I've done here as a little um, resource. And to do that is just a drag and drop. As long as it's electronic, you can drag and drop it on a concept or on a um, linking phrase. OK. Sorry. For well, the postgraduates, I left them up to themselves. Um, they had to study, they've got two exams that they need to do, the basic sciences, one mostly physiology, and then the clinical um, aspect, and some of them were doing the basic sciences and some of them on the clinical. And I just said to them, right, if you're doing basic sciences, I want at least one concept map every month on a basic science topic. Uh, if you're studying for the second exam, give me two on a clinical topic, and you can choose the topic. And they did, and there were no two concept maps the same. Um, and they chose stuff on physiology, like 
cell structure, organelles, etc. Uh, and on the clinical side, they chose things from thyroid functions to liver functions to uh, various illnesses, treatment algorithms, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff that is all on the uh, website for you. If you just want to, for interest's sake, go and have a look um, at what they all did. So the, on the postgraduate side, they had free reign, do whatever they liked. I have given the, a similar sort of talk to our first year undergrads, the so-called extended degree course, where the first years take two years to do their first year uh, MBCHB. And uh, they are going through a very structured course. And they would do their concept maps on particular topics. And they would all do the same sort of topics. But again, they would have free reign as to how they tackle that, when they tackle that. Um, and the marking there isn't, uh, at this stage, strict. It's really just a tool to help them study rather than to assess them. OK. So can I ask you, Certainly. How, how many students do you think you can deal with? Because this, this seems to be taking a lot of your time. Sorry. Um, it did and it didn't. Uh, when I did the marking using, uh, where was it? Using the scoring system, the little video that I showed you where you open up the little side window and I went and I counted um, how many concepts there were and I counted how many propositions, the links in, the links out. Uh, physically I actually had to count them. That was quite time consuming. And that was before I got hold of CMAP analysis, because CMAP analysis can do that for you in seconds, um, and a lot more. Uh, so if you have the tool, great. It can chug through hundreds of concept maps in minutes, which is really fantastic. Um, what is nice about the CMAP analysis tool is that the files are written in XML, so that if you're quite uh, up to scratch as far as XML programming is concerned, you can write your own functions to look at specific as aspects of concept mapping if you're keen to do that. Um, I'm not, I've fiddled around with that, but I actually didn't do much um, different from the tools already built into CMAP analysis. So it, it is very handy if you're wanting to look at hundreds uh, of concept maps. What the literature also tells us on marking concept maps is that there's not much of a correlation between the CMAP scores and your multiple choice questions or our traditional sort of exam formats, MCQs, short questions, uh, interviews, that sort of a thing. It seems to measure a slightly different aspect of the student's knowledge domain. And most authors that I've read on using um, concept maps for marking students recommend that you use more than one approach. So use CMAP tools uh, or concept maps as one aspect of evaluation, but don't throw the rest of the stuff away. Keep using that as well, because you're looking at different aspects of your student's knowledge domain. Okay, last little bit that I'd like to touch on is what you'll find in the uh, literature and particularly on the old internet as described as the personal learning environment. And this is becoming more and more relevant for us in this country as we become part of the so-called net generation. And net generation seems to be quite a uh, well-described age group of learners uh, in particularly first world countries where they have access to fast internet connections, um, PCs just about everywhere, um, and various other aspects which are the aspects driving the so-called personal learning environments are 
realizations that we all have a responsibility to learn lifelong. That besides our formal training, which we all get at universities, schools, etc., there's a lot of informal training on the go, and this does not stop. We are enabled to do this by all sorts of tools, internet access, particularly in this country, getting cheaper by not the day, but probably by the year, I would say. Prices are dropping slowly. The fact that you've got computers mostly in your little pocket PC or um, cell phone, uh, many folks have iPads or some form of tablet PC, and pretty much anywhere you go, you can use some form of computing to link to the net and to drive your own uh, aspect of learning. The realization that a good way to teach is to learn and that unfortunately places like universities, which we all belong to, uh, cannot meet all our learning needs. There are two broad approaches that you'll find to so-called personal learning environments. Uh, the one is mostly organization driven, like big universities, um, folks like Moodle and uh, various other big software systems which allow students to log in and control various aspects of whatever their learning environment is, to set up blogs, to do um, mailing shots to uh, check RSS feeds, uh, to go and draw down lessons, to look for videos, all that sort of a stuff, but centralized in a big teaching institution. That's the one sort of an approach. But to me, although you can personalize uh, the software to do pretty much what you want, you're actually not personal enough. And so I prefer the other approach which is based around a tool like CMAP Tools, which can function on your desktop, can link to the net, uh, is web-based, has built-in security. As you're probably aware, you can lock down your concept map so that folks can use just read-only copies if you place it on the net. Uh, you can allow folks in by invitation to work collaboratively with you if you need to. As I alluded to earlier, you can link to all sorts of electronic documents. The sky's the limit. As long as it's electronic, you can drag and drop a link onto your concept map. They are easy to change and update, which I'm sure you've found yourselves. Facilitates collaboration, which I've talked about earlier on, and then has all sorts of other tools built in, like spell check, slideshows. Create your own little videos. Um, which if you want to show someone how to do a particular concept map is very handy. And you can even, while you're linked to the internet, ask CMAP tools to suggest concepts that you might have forgotten and it'll go out, chug away on the internet <coughs> and suggest some things that you might like to incorporate in your concept map. So I'm very keen for using a tool, particularly like CMAP tools, um, to enhance my personal learning environment and form the basis of lifelong learning. An aspect that I found very interesting um, was finding out that NASA have been using CMAP tools. They have a whole lot of rocket scientists who are getting old and busy uh, getting ready to retire and they're capturing the knowledge base of these guys using CMAP tools uh, to make sure that that information doesn't just retire when the rocket scientists retire. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Any final questions? Interesting. Or you, or you it depends on which department we're talking about. In medicine, I'm the voice in the wilderness. In physiology, 
everybody's using it from students to lecturers. Um, and the project, although it came to an end and, and lasted a year, uh, has had limited success in my own department, but spectacular success in others. And um, we're looking at, at trying to incorporate this from the ground up in first years and subsequent um, years of medical faculty. But the big challenge from my side is not so much the students. They're relatively easy, I think, to adapt and to see the benefits of using this as a study tool. The big challenge is to wean people away from PowerPoint and the sort of very linear structure that you have with PowerPoint and the PowerPoint approach, which is I'll stand there, give the lecture, as opposed to what you can do with concept maps by building things that are called itineraries, where electronically you, you set up the skills that a person has to have in a concept map, link the resources to those skills, and set it up on an electronic resource and tell your students, right, I'll test you at the end of X number of weeks. Off you go. You learn it in whatever order you like. Follow that itinerary. Uh, anything unclear, email me or we'll discuss it in class or whatever the approach might be, um, tutorials. But to use concept mapping as a global overview so that students can get the broad picture rather than just a linear PowerPoint approach. You have that for one question. The second question is when you're dealing with the undergraduate students, teaching them how to use the CMAP tools is, is that a protracted process? I mean, or is it something that they, that, that they, they, pick, they pick it up pretty, pretty uh, quickly? Uh, it usually takes them an hour of hands on. I give them about uh, half an hour, three quarters of an hour bit of theory background, and then off they go and practice and play around with it. What is important, I found, was that um, they come back and they show the rest of their concept maps, and some discover various aspects which they show the group, and others ask questions as to where do I put in the, the focus question, for instance? Um, how do I link this to that? How do I leave out the linking phrase? Various little tricks and techniques um, that you pick up along the way. How do I put a little background picture in? Um, how do I make it uh, a different color, change the font, all that sort of a stuff? Just the little technicalities that you learn with the tool. That folks learn uh, by looking at one another's concept maps and learning and asking questions in the group. Postgrads. That was postgrads. See, my, my concern here is that if, 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 certainly if it's being set as assignments, is that the students obviously need access to computers and the internet infrastructure that goes with it. And I'm just, that causes me a concern. I can see it working at a, at a, at a very well resourced institution where very many where numbers of the students have their own laptops and home yes. environments which have it. Yes. Here, I think we are, the reality is that there are a number of constraints that would have yeah. uh, yeah. Certainly, some of my, my first year students, that was voiced as a concern. Some of them just did not have computers at home, let alone internet connections. Um, and so the uptake is not right across the board, whereas the postgrads different. You know, they've all had salaries, they're all working for years, and they all have some resources at least. Thank you. You all seem quite satisfied. <laughs> Thanks very much.